St. Petersburg, an architectural monument of breathtaking beauty, the most European of all Russian cities. It draws in people from every country on earth. It's a city with a unique history. My name is Domenico Trezzini. I'm an architect from Ticino. I'm going to give this city its appearance, but will its splendor last? St. Petersburg was built as Russia's window to the west, as a bridge to Europe. But it's also a city full of dark sides and secrets. I'm Alexander Pushkin. I made the Russian language the language of poets. I helped the Russian soul express itself. I gave expression to love, but also to hate and despair. Tomorrow, I'm going to fight a duel. Death will be a release for me. The city has been the scene of massive revolutions, and it was renamed Petrograd and later Leningrad. In the Second World War, it went through its worst period. The Germans tried to starve the city. They pulled their noose around it even tighter. The Leningrad blockade lasted for almost 900 days. More than a million people starved or froze to death. My name is Tanya Savicheva. It's my dream to become a singer. My mother's worried. We've got almost nothing to eat anymore. He could have become a legend, a legend of architecture and town planning, but the world has forgotten his name. In spring 1704, the architect Domenico Trezzini arrived on the Russian Baltic coast. It was a cold, inhospitable region that was deeply foreign to him. Trezzini grew up in a small village in Ticino. He studied architecture in Italy. After that, he spent some time in Copenhagen. A year previously, he had been approached by a Russian agent. He was to work in St. Petersburg, a place that didn't exist yet. This was the destination of my long journey. No civilization far and wide. The large fortress I was told about is nothing but a collection of dirty military tents in a marshy wilderness. Is there a worse place to build a city? One year earlier, in 1703, Tsar Peter the Great had ordered the founding of a new city. He wanted to open up the huge Russian Empire to Europe, thereby leading it out of its backwardness. He planned to place Russia's window to the west at the spot where the Neva River flows into the Gulf of Finland. A city from nothing. It was to be built on wasteland, on ground covered in forests and marshes. His city, magnificent, monumental, unique. The core of the city was to be the Peter and Paul fortress on Hare Island. It was to protect the mouth of the Neva from attacks. At this point, it was just an assembly of ramparts equipped with cannon. Trezzini's first task was to build a proper fortress in this location. Then he had his first meeting with the Tsar. It was fortunate he'd learned a bit of Russian beforehand. If only Tsar Peter would say something. 
Произошло несчастье. Пойдемте со мной. Another worker had an accident on site. Ваше величество. Nothing was more dangerous in Russia in those years than working on a building site in St. Petersburg. Accidents, fires, floods were all regular occurrences. Several hundred people died during the construction of Peter and Paul Fortress alone. But malaria, dysentery and scurvy all claimed their tributes. St. Petersburg was built on bones, it was said later. Nobody counted the victims. Especially not Tsar Peter. What's one human life when the goal is making a lifelong dream come true, leading Russia into a new modern era? Domenico Trezzini's discipline and hard work quickly allowed him to rise in the Tsar's favor. The city's most important building projects were in his hands. He was the man who gave St. Petersburg its first face. Trezzini came up with his master plan. He determined the road and canal network. A city of stone. That was something completely new for Russia with its many timber houses. I can hardly believe it myself that this place was marsh and forest just a few years ago. What a unique opportunity to build a new city. St. Petersburg was to be the new capital of the Russian Empire. Trezzini produced countless plans for gardens and palaces, bridges and parks. Will coming generations also appreciate my city? His masterpiece is now one of St. Petersburg's landmarks, the Peter and Paul Cathedral, right in the middle of the fortress on Hare Island. It's still an attraction to countless tourists today. It was built in the early Baroque Dutch style that characterized the Tsar's new residence in the first decades. Its bell tower rises 130 meters into the sky. A carpenter and seven of his brave colleagues risked their lives to install the gilded tip. Trezzini constantly wrote letters to the head of the building office. He was worried about his workers. The number of accidents was increasing. The sick often received no medical treatment. A few days earlier, 20 carpenters had gone on strike because they hadn't been paid. They weren't even able to buy shoes to work. How about him? Was his work appreciated? Some of his colleagues were paid far more than he was, even though they only worked half as much. That was reason enough to write a letter directly to Tsar Peter. I have been serving your majesty since 1703. I get paid a thousand rubles per year, but I'm in urgent need of a bonus because of my family and my need for food and clothing. Tsar Peter appreciated the work of his great architect. He even became the godfather of one of Trezzini's sons. But he didn't grant him any more money. Trezzini gave all his energy for the new city. He trained apprentices and wrote letters to give his workers the best conditions possible. In addition to that, he had a wife and nine children to feed. His worries got worse year upon year until he couldn't go on. On the 19th of February, 1734, Domenico Trezzini died at the age of 64. He was up to his eyes in debt. Today he's all but forgotten. What remains is the city that he fashioned, St. Petersburg. His buildings are admired to this day, especially his masterpiece, the Peter and Paul Fortress. Peter's gate on the eastern side was a homage to Peter the Great. At the southern end of town, the Church of the Annunciation at the entrance to the Alexander Nevsky Monastery.
but his star shines all the brighter, Peter the Great, the founder and eponym of St. Petersburg. For decades, the city had a secret. A veritable treasure lay hidden in the summer palace that Trezzini had built for his master. A treasure the population knew nothing about, a room lined with amber. King Frederick William I of Prussia gave it to the Tsar in 1716. The soldier king, as he was known, had no appreciation for the expensive frippery that his father commissioned. Packed in 18 boxes, the room was moved from Berlin to St. Petersburg in horse-drawn carriages. The Tsar wasn't so sure what to do with this work of art either, and so the treasure lay unheeded in the summer palace for the time being. It wasn't until many years later that the Amber Room was completed and given its place in the Catherine Palace in Zaskoya Stelo, the Tsar's summer residence just outside of the city. It was admired there by generations of people for almost two centuries. Catherine the Great was thrilled by the magnificent chamber. From St. Petersburg, Catherine, the Empress from a German princely family, paved the way for 18th century Russia to enter the modern world. She opened the country up to European education and art. The city on the Neva had been enriched by many architects from all over Europe. One hundred years later, St. Petersburg had long since become the heart of Russia's social life. It had an atmosphere full of pomp and magnificence, but also of vanity, envy and betrayal. After the war with Napoleon, French, the language of the European aristocracy, had become the language of the enemy. But Russian was the language of peasants, not the language of the aristocracy or the literacy. It wasn't until the young poet Alexander Pushkin came along that Russian became acceptable at court. Russia's high society met in St. Petersburg salons for witty conversation about art, literature and politics. Many officers fought side by side with Prussian and Austrian soldiers during the war with Napoleon. Now they were full of hopeful reforms for a constitution that would put limits on the Tsar's absolutism. But anyone voicing such ideas lived dangerously. Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. One of these voices was the 20 year old Pushkin who tried to emulate the German freedom poets. Be glad, my people. I'm healthy, fat, and merry. The press praises me. I ate and drank and I promised. What more could anyone want? But you should also know the following, so I will tell you now. Lavrov is being thrown out and Sots is being admitted to the madhouse. This was too much. Lavrov was an official in the Ministry of Police and Sots was a censor. Anyone mocking the Tsar and his ministers had to pay for it. Pushkin's scandalous performance was immediately reported to the Tsar. Alexander I didn't hesitate to pass judgment. He banished Pushkin to Russia's far south, to Bessarabia. No society, no salons, no scandals. It was here in this isolated location that Pushkin started collecting Russian folk tales. Many of his most significant works were written here. It was here that he became a popular poet. I've got used to the sadness. I've made peace with my fate and I'm bearing this life with a stoic soul. 
Meanwhile, an uprising took place in St. Petersburg. Nicholas I had acceded to the throne. In December 1825, officers refused to swear allegiance to the new ruler out of protest against serfdom, arbitrary treatment by the police and censorship. The leaders were hanged and more than a hundred people were sentenced to forced labor in Siberia. Pushkin was friends with the initiators of this uprising. He even drew some of them. The fact that he was in exile during the uprising was his salvation. One year later, Pushkin was allowed to return to St. Petersburg. But from now on, the Tsar wanted to assess all of his works and censor them personally. He commissioned Pushkin to develop a history of Peter the Great, an imperial commission. Could there be a greater humiliation for the poet of freedom? Now it was he, the Tsar's minion, who was being made fun of. <laughs> There were rumors that his beautiful wife Natalia was secretly enjoying herself with the French nobleman Georges Chardont, the darling of all the ladies in St. Petersburg. Wicked tongues even claimed that the Tsar himself had his eye on the young woman. Anonymous letters in which Pushkin was exposed to ridicule had been circulating for weeks. St. Petersburg society was reveling in spitefulness. Pushkin confronted Baron Dant several times, but he admitted nothing. In his flat on the Moika, right in the heart of St. Petersburg, Pushkin made a fatal decision. He couldn't bear being the target of ridicule at court and an aristocratic society any longer. The continuing humiliation got mixed up with his jealousy. Only a duel could save his honor. He confessed to a friend that he sought death. On the morning of the 27th of January 1837, Alexander Pushkin set off to the river in St. Petersburg to duel with Baron Dont. The bloodier, the better, he wrote. He had made the following comment in a poem a year earlier. No. I won't die fully, as the story goes. The soul will survive my ash and escape decay, and I will be vaunted for as long as there's at least one poet left on earth. Baron Dont was only slightly injured, but Pushkin was badly hurt. Two days after the duel, Alexander Pushkin, who, as a great popular poet, gave the Russian soul a voice like no one else, died. He was only 37. His friend, Alexander Turgenev, cut off one of his curls to give posterity something to remember him by. When news of the poet's death spread, thousands gathered outside his home. They filed past the body for three days. For them, Pushkin wasn't just the Tsar's chronicler, he was first and foremost the poet of freedom. His death as a silent protest against the Tsar's autocratic rule. The dream of freedom 
it stayed alive in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg. For two centuries, the city wasn't just the center of court and social life. It was also here that the dark side of power was concentrated. A place that embodies all of this is house number 16 on the Fontanka. For decades, it was the seat of the political police. Countless confidential letters by informers were assessed here. It was here that decisions were made about banishment and forced labor. There's no monument or play commemorating the victims of the Tsar's secret police. 16 Fontanka is a forgotten place. Despite the arbitrariness and violence, the age of the Tsars was coming to an end. Revolution broke out in the middle of the First World War. In February 1917, Nicholas II was forced to abdicate. Tsars had ruled Russia for almost 400 years. All that was over now. A provisional government took power in the city, which was now called Petrograd, because Petersburg sounded too German. The Winter Palace, formerly the Tsar's residence, now became the seat of the provisional government. But the dream of freedom remained unfulfilled. The new government wasn't able to get the situation under control either. The huge country seemed ungovernable. Meanwhile, a small squat man was traveling on the express train from Helsinki to Petrograd. He was coming from Zurich and had only one goal, to get to Russia as quickly as possible. His name was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin. He was nervous. Russia was the opportunity of a lifetime for him. One of his companions commented shortly before they set off, Either we're ministers in six months' time, or we'll have been hanged. What hardly anyone knew was that the train journey had the approval and active support of the German government. Lenin traveled through Germany with diplomatic status. His train carriage was considered extraterritorial. The German goal was for Lenin to proclaim revolution in Russia. This, they thought, would sap the country's will to continue the war with Germany. After a detour via Sweden and Finland, Lenin arrived at the Finland station in Petrograd shortly before midnight on the 3rd of April, 1917. The original train can still be seen there today. He didn't waste any time making sure those knew who had returned home. He proclaimed a revolution that same night on the square in front of the station. The dream of communism, the dream of a just world. The factories were to belong to the workers and the soil to the farmers. Just like Peter the Great, Lenin wanted to modernize the country. But this time the wealth was to benefit everyone. However, Lenin first needed power and then peace. One day after his arrival, the head of the German military intelligence service in Petrograd sent a message to Berlin. Lenin's arrival in Russia successful. He is working as desired. The German general staff didn't just organize the journey. For years it had been giving money to Lenin's party, the Bolsheviks. The German-Russian money trail ended in an inconspicuous flat in Petrograd's Baskov Street. This is where the money was laundered. The flat was home to the Polish lawyer, Michlaw Koslowski. He channeled the millions from Germany straight into the Bolsheviks' kitty. The Bolsheviks were thereby able to build a powerful party and fund the printing of their newspaper, Pravda. After just a few months, total circulation had risen to more than three million. Money was never a problem for the Bolsheviks. They wanted to bring the idea of a global communist revolution to every corner of Russia through newspapers and flyers.
but then the Russian secret service struck. Early July 1917, a money courier was on her way to the secret meeting place in Baskov Street to deliver the latest funds from Berlin. She was arrested and forced to confess. Lenin was warned at the last moment. By the next day, there were flyers with the sensational story all over the city. Lenin, a spy? Lenin had to go into hiding. He shaved off his beard and fled to Ruzliv, northwest of Petrograd. He spent the next three months living there under a false name, pretending to be helping with the harvest in order to avoid attention. At first he lived in a simple wooden house, then later in a hut made of reeds. It was here that he developed his goal for the coming months, the dictatorship of the proletariat. In mid-October 1917, Lenin secretly returned to Petrograd. On the 25th of October, the Bolsheviks struck. Police stations, train stations, the post office, the state bank, the electricity works, all of the city's strategically important locations were occupied. There are only staged images of this day, ideologically inflated ones. We can only imagine what the October Revolution actually looked like. It was already clear the next morning that the seizure of power had been successful. Lenin now resided in the Smolny Institute, a former educational institution for aristocratic daughters on the outskirts of Petrograd. He had proclaimed just a few weeks earlier, we're ready at all times to hold all the power in our hands. Now the time had come. As the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov became the new Russian leader. He still wrote his pseudonym, Lenin, in brackets at this time. A rapid climb from the cellar to power. My head spins. The German money kept on coming. A few days after the revolution, the German general staff made a further 15 million marks available in order to keep Lenin in power. The plan was successful. In return, Russia relinquished large parts of the west of the country in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in 1918 and declared the war to be over. Germany was finally free to focus on its war with Britain and France. The files about these top secret activities disappeared in the archives for decades. Neither the Bolsheviks nor the German general staff were interested in letting the world know who funded the October Revolution. Lenin moved the seat of government back to Moscow. Now he turned his attention to his enemies within the country. After the Tsarist secret police came Red Terror. A document kept under lock and key for decades. Comrades, we need to set an example. At least a hundred known kulaks, wealthy individuals and leeches need to be hanged. Do this in such a way that even people hundreds of kilometers away see this and tremble. Lenin. Those who didn't agree with Lenin were silenced. Freedom remained a dream. What about Petrograd? Monuments in Lenin's honor were erected in the city on the Neva. It wasn't to be seen as the city of Peter the Great anymore, but as the cradle of the great proletarian October Revolution, Leningrad. Lenin died in January 1924 after several strokes when he was just 53. He was hardly able to walk or talk during the last few months of his life. His legacy was supposed to be the promise of paradise on earth, 
but in truth, it was a totalitarian state. His final resting place wasn't in Leningrad, the city that got his name, but in Moscow, the original capital of the Tsars. The people of Leningrad didn't let the renaming affect them. They affectionately continued to call their city Piotr, the Russian for Peter. The worst trial still lay ahead. The magnificent city became the scene of an unspeakable tragedy in World War II. The 8th of September 1941. The German attack of the Soviet Union had begun a few weeks earlier. Now Hitler's army was outside of the city. Leningrad was surrounded and bombed. More than 6,000 incendiary bombs fell on the first day alone. Entire neighborhoods were destroyed in the mass bombing over the next few days. But Leningrad wasn't taken. The Germans wanted to starve the city before destroying it completely. The 11-year-old Tanya Savicheva, a happy girl, was one of the people living in the besieged city. She dreamed of becoming a singer. Tanya lived with her mother, grandmother and two siblings on Vasilyevsky Island right in the middle of the besieged city. Her sister Nina and her brother Misha had been missing for weeks. Food supplies were running low. Nobody knew how things would go on. Winter was just around the corner. Those who could store up food did so. The city braced itself for a terrible winter. Artworks, statues and monuments were packed away and brought to bomb-proof cellars or, whenever possible, taken out of the city. Then the first frost came. Tanya had been given a small notebook by her mother. It had belonged to her sister Nina, who may have been out there in the Russian winter thinking of her. It snowed heavily yesterday. We can't heat the flat properly anymore. The first diary entry. Shenya died on the 28th of December, 1941, at half past 12. Shenya was Tanya's elder sister. She was only 32. Every morning she had walked seven kilometers to the munitions factory to make shells. Then the way back, another seven kilometers. On the 28th of December, her body couldn't cope with the strain anymore. <laughs> Only Tanya's mother, her grandmother and her 24-year-old brother Leonid were still alive. The Leningrad blockade had gone on for three months already. Shenya's death was only the beginning. The city's inhabitants were to die of starvation. Three million people. That's what the German regime decided. By December 1941, more than 50,000 residents of Leningrad had died. The German soldiers outside the city watched this mass dying. They had long cut off the most important supply routes into the center. The official position was that Germany had no interest in maintaining the population. Leningrad was starving. The official ration was 125 grams of bread a day. 
Ration cards went into circulation in December, but this wasn't enough food to be full. The only way for food to get into the city was across the frozen Lake Ladoga in the east. The road of life, as it was called, was the last hope for the people of Leningrad. But the transports weren't enough to feed everyone. Vehicles fell through the ice when the weather warmed. No family was spared. Tanya commented at the end of January. Grandmother died on the 25th of January, 1942, at three o'clock in the afternoon. Two days after Tanya's 12th birthday, Leningrad, formerly the proud city of Petersburg, was slowly and pitifully breathing its last. The supply chain had collapsed. Those who had the strength to help themselves and others got what they needed to survive by whatever means possible. Tanya Savicheva's diary became a chronicle of the dying city. Leka died on the 17th of March, 1942, at five in the morning. Now her brother was dead as well. A short while later, her two uncles died. The city had no strength left to take care of the dead. The dead bodies were taken to the cemeteries on sledges, where they were buried in mass graves. On some days, up to 3,000 people died. Some things that happened during this winter were too terrible to make public. These files were under lock and key up until a few years ago. Pavel Bashagin, on the 6th of December, he hit his wife in the hat with an axe, chopped up her body and ate it, sentenced to death by shooting. Igor Shevchenko, on the 18th of December, he took a male corpse from the cemetery home and ate it, sentenced to death by shooting. Soon, all that was left to eat was soup out of scrap bread, soaked wallpaper and wheat paste. Ate, Mama? Yes, Tanya. Tanya's mother always gave her five spoonfuls more than she gave herself. Almost a million people died during the first winter of the blockade. On Vasilyevsky Island, where Tanya lived, and in Leningrad's other neighborhoods. Tanya's last entry in mid-May 1942. Mummy died on the 13th of May 1942 at half past seven in the morning. All of the Savachevs are dead. Tanya is alone. Tanya was found in her flat in August 1942. Together with 140 other children, she was evacuated from Leningrad. She spent two years in various orphanages and hospitals. Leningrad survived. On the 27th of January 1944, the terror came to an end. The Red Army broke through the German defensive lines. Around 800,000 people cheered the end of the blockade after two and a half years. But it was too late for Tanya. A doctor noted... Tanya needs rest, special care, food and a better climate. And especially loving, motherly affection. Her heart stopped beating on the 1st of July, 1944.
Her diary has found a new home on the road of life that runs from Lake Ladoga into the city. Eight stales contain the story of how one Leningrad family was wiped out in the war. After the end of the war, residential neighborhoods were built around Leningrad's old center. The population grew to a million, a bustling city. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the city went back to its old name of St. Petersburg. It has been remembering its roots as the Tsar's residence and is attracting more and more tourists. A German gesture of reconciliation took place in Catherine Palace in Saxkoye Selo. German troops had completely destroyed the palace in the Second World War. The Amber Room, which had been admired here for almost 200 years, was lost. Restorers started working on recreating the eighth wonder of the world as it is known. A German company donated several million dollars towards the reconstruction of the precious chamber. On the 31st of May 2003, it was handed over to the public in a ceremonial act. The Amber Room. Since Peter the Great, it has been considered a symbol of German-Russian friendship. The fact that it was possible to go back to that after the Second World War is an important signal for both peoples. Today, St. Petersburg has regained its old splendor. The city changed names three times, but at its heart, it always stayed true to itself. Germans, Russians and people from all over the world now meet on the banks of the Neva. More than 300 years after the Tsar had his city built in a marshy wilderness.